Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribe to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what else helps build the channel? Tell your friends about it so they can like and subscribe it too. And make sure you watch all the videos. Let them know about the best wine show anywhere. And welcome to my Thanksgiving Day special for 2021. While things haven't completely gotten back to normal, we are seeing more families gathering. And with the holiday season upon us, we have more friends and families wanting to gather to celebrate. Like last year, just be safe on all fronts. So this year, I combined the traditional with the non-traditional when it comes to wine. I'm super excited to do these wines. One is effectively a natural wine, one I've visited in the past, and another should be killer. So let's get to the background on all these wines. First up is the Old Westminster Winery. This is a winery in Maryland. Yes, kids, Maryland. Remember, all 50 states make wine. Maybe not all 50 grow grapes or wine grapes, but they do make wine. Though I think in the case of Alaska and Hawaii, it's from other fruits like pineapples and blueberries. The Old Westminster Winery started out as a farm. Not sure exactly when, but the year 1985, 1985 appears, so the farm may have started back then. Anyway, in 2009, the family decided to go into wine growing and wine making. The website says that they discuss how to preserve our farm and put the land to work. A trip to St. Helena uh, in 2010 sparked the start of their wine journey. They went out to Napa a year before I did. Anyway, over the next few years, no, I went there in 14. <laughs> I wish I'd gone back in 10 or 11. All right, over the next few years, they learned as much as they could. In 2011, they planted their first vines. That would be Cabernet Franc, Syrah, Chardonnay, and Albarino. That has grown to now... Uh, they've grown to have a production of about 30,000 bottles a year, and they use about 50-50 estate versus, uh, versus purchase fruit. The winery is truly a family operation. Jay and Virginia Baker are the founders. Their children each have a role in the operation. Lisa Hinton is the winemaker. Ashley Johnson is the GM, and Drew Baker is the, quote, farmer, as they put it. They make a fairly wide range of wines, bubbles, whites, rosés, and reds. They even do canned wine. Check this out. Don't sleep on canned wine. It's a great way to package wine when glass just won't work. Anyway, they hand harvest all their grapes and they are 100% Maryland grapes. It's not uncommon for wineries, not in the quote, big four of California, Oregon, Washington, and New York to buy fruit from outside of their state. Usually California uh, is where they get it from as they have more grapes than they know what to do with most of the time. All right, so the winery or the family practices sustainable farming. They utilize cover crops, biodynamic sprays, certified organic pesticides, etc. They aren't certified in any of these things, but a winery really doesn't need to be. It's nice to see the logos, but as long as they are honest and transparent, I'm cool with it. Speaking of all that stuff, you've been watching my stuff on Fridays, all about this type of farming and the wines you make from it. There you go. All right. While I was able to gather a, actually a decent amount of information, at first I didn't think I had anything, but looking at the information I, I got, I was able to get a good amount of information from the website and the bottle. Um, I went ahead and emailed them a couple days before recording this uh, on 10 15 21. Technically it's 10 16 because it's 12 36 or 0, 0, 30, 0, 36, you know, in the morning. Anyway, I want to get some more insight on the winemaking and farming practices. I know I just told you what they do, but I wanted to have like a little more insight. I'm not too familiar with this style of wine called the Piquette. Uh, I'll cover what I did find out in a little bit though, as far as Piquette. Now I did get a reply that my email was forwarded, email was forwarded to their winemaker, Lisa, but I never heard back by the time I did the recording. So if I get additional information, I'll be sure to include it in a lower third or in the, the sidebar that I usually use. Um, as long as I get it in a reasonable amount of time. Considering this is the Thanksgiving episode and recording it in the middle of October, there's, if they get back to me, I'm sure I can place the edit and, and upload it in time for Thanksgiving. 
Anyway, um, October is harvest time in general. So Lisa just may not have a lot of time right now. You know, and I only gave him like a two day notice. So it wasn't like I emailed him like a two or three weeks ago. All right. So essentially from the email, I was looking for confirmation that this could be called a natural wine. It has a lot of characteristics of one. The problem is that natural wine really has no legal definition and most winemakers that consider their wines natural like it that way. Or I've been told by several people who rep these kinds of wines. All right, so let's get into the stats. The 2020 Old Westminster Winery, called Take It Easy, $22 on their website. I got it for about the same price. It is a Piquette style. It's from Maryland. It's 60% Chambresson, 35% Piquette Blanc, 5% Piquette Rouge, and then brightened to taste with Verjou. Uh, native yeast or wild fermentation. No added sulfites. All right, FYI, they do have the standard contains sulfite statement on the label, which means they have at least 10 parts per million of sulfites. It may only be 10 parts per million, but once you hit 10 parts per million, you have to put uh, contains sulfites. If you have less than 10, you can put naturally occurring sulfites or you can put no added sulfites, which the bottle does say uh, on the back, no added sulfites, but it also says contains sulfites, all right? Anyway, uh, it's unfined, it's unfiltered, and the ABV is only 10%. So what is a piquette? Well, it's typically a lighter style of wine. It's a way to use the kind of leftovers of winemaking to make another wine. The pomace, that's the solids that are left over from fermentation, are re-fermented. This may include adding water, or in this case, using a base of another grape. Uh, the Chambresson. At least that's what I'm gleaning from, from all that. Uh, basically, it's a way to kind of re -recycle, you know, to recycle your stuff. Now, it's been described as a wine that was traditionally consumed by vineyard workers. It tends to have a light fizz and low alcohol. Now, while 10% isn't high, uh, it also isn't necessarily low, at least not in my opinion. Now, this is probably due to the use of the Chambresson as the main component of the wine. If it had been just pomace and water, then the ABV probably would have been like in that 5-ish percent range, or maybe even lower, kind of like those all-day IPAs. The term verjou refers to a highly acidic juice made by pressing unripe grapes, crab apples, or other sour fruit. So think of it as a processing aid or additive, a natural one though. Now, I had a couple of these uh, types of wines at Tiwa, or the Texum International Wine Awards this past April. Uh, it was interesting for sure. I liked it. Uh, I'd never heard of this style of wine, and it seems to have become somewhat of a thing in 2021. Next, we have the Lingua Franca Winery. I had the pleasure of visiting them in 2019 in October. I didn't get an interview, but I did get to join a private tasting. I didn't have this wine, but I did have another Chardonnay along with some other wines uh, on their tasting menu. All of them were excellent. Now, Lingua Franca was founded by Master Sommelier Larry Stone. Larry is a legend in the Psalm community. He's literally one of the OGs of Psalms in the United States. He's worked, bo he's worked both on the floor and for the wineries, a floor of, the, of a restaurant. Now, before Lingua Franca, he also worked for Quintessa in Napa and Evening Land in Willamette. Their wines don't suck, neither one of those wineries. They make excellent wines. So if you ever get a chance to try them, you should. So Larry spent a couple years negotiating with the Jansen family, that's the original owners of the farm, uh, and so he negotiated with them to purchase their 150-acre farm. He closed the deal on New Year's Eve of 2012, so I bet you that was a really cool celebration. Originally, they were just going to sell the fruit, and but Larry, knowing literally everyone, got some advice from none other than Dominique Lafon, a legend in Burgundy. Now, Lafon suggested Larry make wine instead of selling the fruit. A virtual all-star team came together to realize the dream of making wine in the Aola Amity Hills uh, AVA of Willamette Valley in Oregon. They make almost exclusively Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. However, Oregon does, extreme, well, Oregon does extremely well with Burgundian varieties, plus Pinot Gris. However, I did have a wine not on their tasting menu that was a Riesling from legendary wine grower Mimi Castile. Now, Mimi Castile is the sister of Ben Castile, who's the son of half of the founders of Bethel Heights. And during that trip, I also had an awesome tasting with them and lunch. How cool is that? Um, but I got to have like a private tasting with Ben Castile uh, with their wines. So I got to kind of meet some more royalty, if you want to call it that. 
Um, anyway, the Bethel Heights wines are amazing too. You should try them. Anyway, um, Oregon can do really well with a lot of grapes. Uh, we just associate Oregon with Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, and Chardonnay. The 2017 Lingua Franca AVNI or Avni Chardonnay. Normal retail at the place I bought it from was $35.98, but I got it on clearance for $17.98. So you know what I did? I bought two of them uh, from Willamette Valley. Red soils and basalt rocks for the soil. Uh, Chardonnay should be 100%. They're, not, they're, they're replicating burgundy type of stuff, so they're not going to mix anything else in there. Whole cluster pressed. It's settled in tank for 24 hours, then barrel fermented for 11 months. 27% of which is new, and they are 600 liter punchins. Those are the really big barrels. Um, they have bigger barrels, but these are really big barrels. And then 73% in old French oak barriques. That's what we normally think of as uh, oak barrels when we're about aging wine. Aged an additional five months on the lees in stainless steel prior to bottling, and the ABV is 13%. Now from the back label of the wine, uh, it says, Avni means stone or rock and is a signature of our geology in the Willamette Valley. Our third one comes from Henri Bourgeois, officially Famille Bourgeois. Uh, they have a few dozen wines that almost all come from different areas of the Loire Valley. They've been growing and making wine for 10 generations there. They concentrate on Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc. They also have a winery in New Zealand that does Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc. That was kind of cool. Anyway, Henri Bourgeois is the person credited with putting the family on the map in the 1950s, hence why his name is on the label. Today's wine isn't a Pinot Noir, but a Cabernet Franc. So excited, dude. I cannot wait to try this. So let's see the stats on this one. 2018 Henri Bourgeois Petit Bourgeois. $14.99 normal retail. Got it for clearance for $9.99. I only bought the one bottle, though. Uh, the Val de Loire IGP. That's uh, the larger... Um, that's kind of the larger designation of, you know, Loire Valley in general. Uh, then you have like all those sub-appellations. Uh, Cabernet Franc, it should also be 100%. They do 10 to 12 days uh, maceration, and the ABV is 13.5%. Not a lot of information on the wine. I really couldn't find anything. All right, so let's get into these wines. Do you know how excited I am? So why did I choose these wines specifically for Thanksgiving? Well, uh, one, hearing that this is effectively a natural wine, I was like, I was intrigued because I don't, I don't get to uh, try a lot of natural wines. And in, you're watching this as Thanksgiving or the week before Thanksgiving or the week of Thanksgiving, my natural wine episode should be coming up pretty soon. It's, it, I believe it's scheduled whatever Friday in, in, in December. So you definitely want to check that out about natural wine. And I've, I've mixed, I've had a mixed bag with natural wines. I've had some natural wines that were amazing. And I've had some natural wines that there was something weird with them. Um, I get into all that in that episode. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk too much about that because you'll need to watch the natural wine episode anyway. But I thought it'd be kind of cool, uh, kind of funky. I mean, I don't know if it's actually funky, but it'd be kind of different. And I think there's some cool pairings that you could do with Thanksgiving fare with a wine like this. Not just because it's natural, but it's a rosé, which I think rosés are awesome. Uh, in the fall, they're they're such a food-friendly wine. And then um, uh, Chambrosan, I don't really drink a lot of Chambrosan. And Piquet, like I'm combining a lot of cool things at once as I'm struggling to pull this out. Anyway, um, and then the Chardonnay, just a standard Chardonnay. I mean, a standard like pairing or Thanksgiving wine. And I know the quality of this winery, so I thought it'd be kind of cool to do this one. I haven't had this, I haven't had this specific Chardonnay from them yet, so I'm really excited to do it. And then Cabernet Franc. So instead of going Pinot Noir, which I do have Pinot Noirs at the house, I was like Cabernet Franc. I love Cabernet Franc. Now this is just Loire Valley, so Chinon and uh, Bruguil are two of the most well-known places that make. Uh, Cabernet Franc wines. And so I don't know if some of these are coming from vineyards in that area. Maybe it's a combination of things. Uh, maybe there's other areas in the Loire Valley that are growing Cabernet Franc, so they can't use a more specific um, appellation. And because it is just the Loire Valley, instead of like Chinon, it's about half the price of a Chinon. So 
Going for a little bit of value here. I mean, I took advantage of a clearance sale. This is, you know, $35, $36 bottle of wine. Um, and then this is, you know, $20 something dollars. So try to keep it at a value point. All right, so let's check out these wines. I'll lift my, my white papers over here. Bam. One day I'm gonna put the overhead back up, but the camera I use for that it's a little bit wonky to use for the um, for the overhead. Plus, just how I have to do it is just kind of weird because there's you can't see it, but I have a chandelier here, um, and I just I, I I've taken pictures of it. I put my little DJI Osmo Pocket in the <laughs> kind of hanging in there, and uh, it works. But also when I do these reviews, I forget to turn it off in between reviews and only turn it on when I'm about to do the do the overhead and it runs out of battery like in the after like one or two recordings so it's kind of a pain to do someday I'll, I'll have a legitimate overhead anyway uh you know color wise um you know it's kind of got this somewhat pink and orange color to it so Orange wine. So you may have heard the term orange wine. That's a white wine that's made in a red wine style. But they mean by that is you have you have uh, the maceration process, and red wine goes through maceration, and during maceration, fermentation happens. Uh, sometimes they'll do a cold maceration in red wine, and there's no fermentation happening. They're just getting extraction, and then they go through the fermentation process. With white wines, you don't normally you just you just squeeze the juice out of the grapes, and then you ferment it because all the color comes from the skins. And since white wines don't really have a lot of color, it doesn't make sense. For orange wines, you have to do really, really extended maceration for like, like a month. Um, and then you start getting this kind of pinkish, not quite orange, it's kind of where I've got the orange wine uh, term from. Anyway, this is not necessarily orange, it's kind of like um, kind of a peach color, honestly. And you can, you may not be able to tell, but you can tell it's, it's not filtered. There's a little bit of haze to it. So that's, that's fine. Society in general has gotten used to these crystal clear wines because people kind of look at hazy wines as something wrong or it doesn't, doesn't, you know, it doesn't look right. We, we eat and literally drink with our eyes. So if it's not appealing to our eyes, then we're not going to consume that product. Uh, but this is the way it used to be done. Um, I mean, there was filtration and finding even hundreds of years ago, but we want to talk thousands of years ago. This is what the wine would have come out as. Anyway, so yeah, it's kind of like a peachish orange color, a little bit of haze to it. Um, let's go and smell it. So there's a tartness to it. It's like a, there's a little bit of sourness to it. And that's, that's going to be probably from the Biquette side of things because it has a higher acidity. It's going to be a tart thing. You know, it's the, it's the spent uh, grape skins. Also, in, a lot of times it includes the the seeds or the pips, and uh, a lot of times it will include the um, the stems. So it's really kind of citrusy. It, it's a lot of it's almost like a lemon iced tea that I'm, I'm smelling, but there's not a whole lot coming out of of the nose on this. There's a little bit of floral, but not a ton of floral. And I don't want to use the word funk because funk to me usually means a specific type of aroma, but there's a, there's something different to it. There's a, um, actually I kind of feel like I get a touch of volatile acidity. Yeah. It kind of feels like there's a little bit of volatile acidity. I sometimes associate it with barbecue sauce because barbecue, barbecue sauce uses vinegar a lot of times. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the wine. It's probably the wine making style and it's, it's such, it's so small that I didn't notice it at first, and now I'm looking for it. Well, I, I thought I smelled it, now I'm looking for it. So now I'm finding it. So I, it may not really be there. When I get on the palate, we'll, we'll confirm all that. But there is a tartness and a sourness and a touch of VA, a little bit. And like red fruits, like cherry. Like, it's, like it smells like a sour cherry. I just taste it. Super light. So remember I told you that if you can't, it's usually the, you know, the pomace and they just add water. There is a bit of that. It, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a tea. So it's kind of like you got like this kind of, and I get a little bit of peach now. It's kind of like a peach, lemon, cherry tea. That's not super strong. It is refreshing. I mean, it's only 10% alcohol. Uh, 
my understanding is a lot of piquettes are actually lower in alcohol if they're just using the pomace, but because they did a legitimate fermentation of a grape, that's probably where the majority of that alcohol is coming from. So it's a little bit, it's really light. This would absolutely go with like, if you have like an appetizer going on, especially if you have something fruit dominant with appetizers, but if you have like um, a charcuterie thing going on with cheeses, put some, put some fruits on there, traditional fruits like strawberries, grapes, you know, you don't do anything crazy. And some uh, lighter cheeses, you don't want like heavy cheese, you don't want like, like smoked cheddars and goudas and stinky cheeses that would overpower the wine. But, you know, just like your standard hard cheeses that aren't like super, super heavy as far as aromas and flavors, that would probably go well with this. This would also go really well with if you have a salad going on, a lighter salad, like with maybe a raspberry vinaigrette, um, not like a ranch dressing or like that. A lot of times I talk about spinach salads with, with, a, um, with a honey mustard dressing or some other dressing and pecans. I wouldn't necessarily go spinach salad with this. You could, but I would have a, a raspberry vinaigrette, something that's really light and bright to go with this. Yeah, there's a bit of sourness to it. So I like the wine. This is wine that I feel really needs food, in my personal opinion. I could drink this. If I was to drink it straight, it would need to be like a hundred degrees out. Like, and I'm sitting out like outside on, on a, you know, in, on, on a blanket somewhere in the park, in a, in a park or whatever, or you know, on the porch or you're by the pool, no glass at the pool, but you know, like you put this, you put it in like a, like a something like this, but like maybe like one of those metal ones. And then you drink it out of your, um, you know, Govino cup. That's how you do it, dude. I can see doing that. But for me, I think it would be best with food and lighter fare, like a, like salads, charcuterie, lighter charcuterie. I wouldn't necessarily worry about having meat on there. So really just like a, more like a cheese tray, cheese and fruit tray. So um, a crudite more like, but, and I probably, I wouldn't really worry about the vegetables. That's anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that tartness is really refreshing. Is it my favorite style of wine? No, but I like it. And it's something a little different and I, I will definitely enjoy it. I think there's gonna be a lot of people that won't particularly care for it, but I think there's a good amount of people that will be like, oh, this is kind of cool and I like it. So um, this is, if you like what I'm describing, think of it almost like a, like a, like a sour beer. Not quite because it's got other things going on that makes it not a beer. But if you think of it in that sense, I, I when I was researching this, I, I saw an article talking about piquettes with a white claw of wine because White Claw has been like a thing, but in some ways it is reminiscent of a seltzer. However, in this case, there isn't really a lot of fizz. There's not a lot of carbonation to this. So if it was more of like a frizzante, like say two or three <clears throat> atmospheres, then it would be something like, be like, it'd probably be closer to like a seltzer. And everybody loves seltzers, right? They're okay. I've had some seltzers that were not really, good, they were not good at all. All right. So, that's the piquette. If you if you if it sounds like you like that type of style and you're gonna have the type of food at Thanksgiving or just in general, check it out. Um, they are distributed in a lot of states, but you're probably gonna have a hard time finding it. You probably have to go to like a specialty wine shop in order to get it. All right, let's go move on to the lingua franca, the Avni Chardonnay. A typical Chardonnay color. You've got you know kind of a medium straw color. Got a little bit of, of uh, yellow and gold going on there and a touch of green, but not much. So you've got, you know, you've got some really good aromatics going on. It's not jumping completely out of the glass, but it's not like I don't have to stick my nose all the way to smell anything. I do get, like this would be a wine if I smell them, like it is Chardonnay, 100%, no question about it. Why? Because there's a little bit of popcorn, a little bit of almost burnt popcorn. What does that mean? Uh, I've, I've asked a few winemakers and some of them really don't know, but I had a couple that's, that say that when you do the fermentation in stainless steel and you don't have an air, you don't have an aerobic, you have an anaerobic or not anaerobic, um, environment. So no oxygen that you get these sulfurous type of reduction or reductive qualities. And I guess that's where they come from. I've also had people tell me it was a hot fermentation, but I don't think it was a hot fermentation. 
or hot and fast fermentation. But that the type of fermentation, how hot it is, or the temperature and the speed of it will affect the aromas and flavors of, of a wine. It's there. Um, you also get like the pomaceous fruit. So you get those golden apples. You get, um, you also get some orange out of this, some peach, white peach. There's a touch of like cream to it that's going to be coming from the malolactic, but not butter. It's not a buttery Chardonnay. I'm not getting the super classic diacetyl, which is the chemical name of the aroma of the aroma, the butter, aroma of butter. And I wouldn't expect to be like, I don't, would not expect it to be like a buttery Chardonnay. Other than that, you know, even though there's oak going on in here, since a lot of it was uh, used oak, it's, and the, the new oak was really big barrels, it's not coming through. Like I would almost, I would almost think that this was not an oaked wine if I was just going by the nose alone. There's a little bit there. There's a little bit of vanilla. So, and partially cream. So not quite a creamsicle. I don't really get like the, the peach stuff, but there's a little bit of orange in there. So yeah, creamsicle. This is a, a little bit richer style of Chardonnay. I would equate this on the burgundy side to something like a Puy Fusse, um, maybe even like a richer Puligny Montrachet, uh, Chasson Montrachet, something like that. Something in the more southern part of Burgundy. Um, there's something of richness, there's a broadness to it. That's from the malolactic. You also have the lees uh, aging. That's also going to add to your mouthfeel. Um, there's a cream to it, but it's not a butteriness to it. I think it's an excellent Chardonnay. It's well made. Is it my favorite style of Chardonnay? No, but that's okay. My favorite style of Chardonnay is Chablis. So that would be steely, uh, lean, flinty, that type of stuff. I will definitely enjoy this Chardonnay. I'm happy I bought two bottles, especially because, you know, it's worth the 36 bucks it normally is. I'm just letting you know. But I'm happy I got two for one on this. Because wine always tastes better when you get it on a deal. I think this is an excellent Chardonnay. I think a lot of people will like this Chardonnay. I think this appeals to the uh, the average palate for Chardonnay, but that doesn't want that super oaky, buttery style. Like they want, they want that. I kind of call this style middle of the road. It's got a little bit of oak to it. It doesn't really have any butter, but it has a little bit of richness to it, and that's more from the malolactic and the lees aging but there's an awesome balance to this wine. And that was, that's really what I think sets this wine apart from say others that might be, especially others that are truly in the under $20 range versus like this wine. You got some balance, you have some really good structure to it. Acidity is a little high. I'm not, not, I don't mean high, like out of balance high. It's, I would call it a medium plus acidity. A lot, of, yeah, with a lot of salivating going on. That gives it an additional freshness to it. It kind of hits you up front with all those aromas and flavors and it just kind of, it kind of fades out. So I don't feel like it has a long finish. It starts off kind of round and then it kind of thins out. I think with food, again, this is another one. I think if you're having a uh, Thanksgiving meal with it, it would be awesome. Uh, stuffing would be great with it. Your turkey and stuffing would be awesome with this, especially if you've got the, the cranberries going on. Um, I know you're talking red fruit versus like uh, citrus fruit, but... I think it would really enhance what's going on. Um, you know what would be great with this? Ham. Especially if you have like, you know, the traditional ham with like the, the cloves on it and the honey. I think I think the ham would be a killer pairing with this. I think it would be better than the thanks than your Thanksgiving turkey. I think your Christmas ham or your thanks or you can have a ham for Thanksgiving too. It'd be great if you did something like pork. I think it'd be great, like if you have like some type of uh orange. Uh, kind of like a, a sweet and sour or orange type of sauce you put on there. Uh, we we kind of do that at the house uh, with porks, with porks, with pork and chicken and stuff like that. It's really cool. Uh, we knew some Old Bay recently with that. So I think this would be awesome with something, with something like that. Yeah, I think it's an excellent wine. All right, on to uh, the Henri Bourgeois. All right, so it's uh, it's not completely opaque. It's a little, there's a little bit of translucency, but not a lot. We got some red and a little bit of blue going on in here. I wouldn't necessarily call it purple. Really light staining on the glass. Oh my goodness. So this is 
kind of a Christmas in a glass type of wine. So you're getting red and black fruits in this, like blackberry and raspberry. And they're kind of ripe, not quite candied or, or confectionery, but they're ripe. But then you get then you get these spices going on here. Some Christmas spice going on. You're getting uh, a little bit of herbaceousness. Now, Cabernet Franc is known to have uh, pyrazine. That's the chemical name or the official name for it. And that gives us things like bell pepper, jalapeno. It can also give us things like, like uh, just green leafy stuff, okay? Man, I could sit here and just smell this wine all day long. Uh, I don't think there's a ton of new oak on this, but I think there was a little bit of oak going on here. Because I do get a little bit of cinnamon, a little bit of clove, that type of stuff. It smells juicy. I, I just got to drink this thing. I'm not choking. There's nothing wrong. I keep having these little like almost hiccups right now. Um, it tastes really good. Now, this is normally like a 15-ish dollar bottle of wine. Um... And it, it's, I think it fits right in that price point. If you told me it was 20 bucks, I'd be like, okay, that's fine. Um, getting it for $10. Yeah. So when you look at the color and you smell it, it smells like a light wine, like a, a spiced Pinot Noir. It smells a little bit like Gamay, like a Beaujolais, Cru Beaujolais. When you put it in the palate, there's a lightness to it, but then the tannin kind of goes, hey, I'm here. So I'm getting those, I'm getting those red and black fruits. I'm getting a little bit of violet, so a little bit of purple flower. I'm getting those spices and some clove and cinnamon, possibly from oak. Also, uh, Cabernet Franc can have some spice characteristics to it. There is a bit of green, like um, like fern is usually what I what I associate with this, and that is for me is a marker for pyrazine. Something that's not over the top pyrazine. It's not that bell pepper or that jalapeno, which I do like in Cabernet Franc. This puts me more in the Gamay, Blau Francish um, type of Menthea type of camp as far as a spice driven wine, but with some really, good, really good, pretty fruit and some floral. This is your turkey wine. This is your wine that, you know, this is why you're, you're doing a turkey and you're having the um, the stuffing in there, especially if you have some really cool stuff in the stuffing as far as like flavors and spices and all that. Um, to me, Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners are very similar. So you could use these for Christmas also. Um, but yeah, I think this is better off with say ham or something like a pork uh, or even if you do some chicken, you, you know, Chicken and Chardonnay are like classic. Stick with something that's a little more, a little more powerful, like the turkey. If you're doing steaks, you totally could do steaks. I wouldn't do like ribeyes necessarily, um, but if you had some type of uh, fillet or New York strip or sirloin, um, and you spiced it just right, I think it would complement that. This wine is really killer. Let me go back to. Let's go back to the Chardonnay real quick. Yeah. Wow, that that iced tea aroma, really that peach tea type thing is really strong in this now. That's a really cool, that's a really cool wine. And that's warmed up a little bit more. I think it's I think it's actually drinks really well. Um Chardonnay's good. I like it. I definitely like this this uh Cabernet Franc the best of the three. But that doesn't mean you would like it the best. You might like the Chardonnay better, or you might like the the um, Champoisson Piquette. Anyway, um, that's really going to do it for this episode. Uh, I hope that uh, you got value out of this. Hope you enjoy what I'm doing here. And if you do, please make sure you hit that like button and make sure you subscribe and tell all your friends about it. And until next time, drink some killer, I don't know, anything, Chardonnay. I, you know, here, drink some killer Piquette.